So first of all, thank you very much. This is a great opportunity for me. I'm very happy and very honored to be down here sharing about fileless malware. I'm going to talk about what is fileless malware, how an attack is performed using this type of technique. And of course, I'm going to provide some a general recommendation that hopefully will, will be very useful for you to protect against this type of a threat. So as, I'm, as you mentioned, my name is Juan Araya. I have a bachelor degree in computer science. I have also a master in cybersecurity. Uh, thank God I hold a, a several cybersecurity related um, certifications, including you know, the Certified Advanced Security Practitioner and some cloud certifications. And feel free, of course, to add me as a contact on LinkedIn. I'll be more than glad to interact and to clarify doubts after this session, of course, if you have a, any additional no question. So the agenda is going to be extremely simple. The agenda, I'll provide a quick introduction about what is fileless malware, how mal and, and of course, what is malware. Then what is fileless malware, how an attack is performed, what is the risk, what is the impact. So those type of information I'll share during the introduction. Then we'll focus on what is living of the land, what is lulpins, you know, where basically we're going to use existing and legitimate tools against our victim. That's the idea of living off the land. So with the lulpins, we are going to use existing, as I said, libraries. And we are going to use existing executable files, scripts. We will use good tools such as PowerShell, such, such as Dolemi to cause damage. Finally, I'll provide some general recommendations about how to detect and what to do to protect your company against fileless malware attacks. So let's go to the basics because before we go to fileless malware. So as you know, what is malware? Malware is malicious, it stands for malicious software. There are several type of malicious software such as virus, where normally you know, the traditional a virus will require some sort of human interaction where someone will download something, someone will execute a file, someone will install an application and that executable file will perform some malicious actions such as delete files, such as um, steal information, or even download other type of malware. The Armor virus, the one that, that comes in the second um, you know, picture, we're talking about a, a virus that has the capability of encryption and or use obfuscation techniques to make very hard you know, the reverse engineering process. Then the Trojan will be in tools that or application that you could download that looks legitimate or some of them you will download it because you want to avoid paying you know, for the license. In other words, a piracy. So people will download this type of application. It will work as the way it is supposed to work. However, it also will be executing some other actions that will impact the confidentiality of the data, maybe the integrity of the data, or even more, even the availability of the data. The bots will be, you know, malicious software designed to take control of your computer, uh, and that way your computer will be computer or IoT device of or mobile device will be receiving. Uh, requests or commands and will be executing those commands such as, okay, all these computers that are infected, let's try to access a, a website. So sooner or later, that web server, the resources of that web server will be consumed and that will cause a denial of service attack. The worm will be a type of malware that will copy automatically. It will automatically scan for computers that has an, a specific vulnerability and will automatically is a copy. So there's no require of human interaction. This spyware will be you know tools that are designed to spy whatever you type for example a keylogger then adware will be a um, malicious software designed to uh, simulate clicks and that way the attacker will receive money in a in an illegal way and ransomware you know ransomware is a terrible type of malware designed to take control of your computer you know host in, in, you know encrypt all your files and if and only if in theory you pay it, then in theory, you, you will be able to continue using your files. Of course, it's not a good idea to pay. It's better to be proactive and it's better to have very good backups and you know threat intelligence and proactively block those type of attack vectors. How malware is normally distributed is distributed using email, uh, social engineering techniques, you know, by sending emails that looks legitimate that invite people to click uh, on a hyperlink or to download an application. For example, um, 
USB keys that has a malware using an auto run, you know, feature that as soon as you connect the, the USB key, it will execute, you know, the malicious commands. And nowadays, because everybody use a mobile devices and we use uh, several social media tools such as, I don't know, Telegram or WhatsApp, which are good tools. However, attackers are using it to send by bulk load messages that use techniques such as tiny URLs to encode and to send malicious uh, hyperlinks. So as I said, the, there are many techniques in order to start distributing the a malware. One of them is to use, is to use, for example, a type of squatting attack where they register a URLs that looks legitimate, you know, very similar to the uh, official website. So people could uh, fail on that attack or emails that looks legitimate that contains even the logos of the company the color coding you know of the of the company and of course as i said you know the famous usb drop key you know where you are basically using a rubber duck key a usb key and people sooner or later will connect it to their personal device or to the company computer now Let's talk about fileless malware because this is another type of a malware attack. Down here, the idea is to try to use good tools, existing tools. The idea is to avoid having to install an application. Without installing any malware, we're gonna use existing tools and legitimate tools to perform malicious attacks. So for example, what type of existing tools will be useful to perform a fileless malware attack? We are talking about exploiting good tools from WMI, the Windows Management Instrumentation tool from PowerShell or even just a common shell, you know, because uh, all these um, tools has many useful libraries, many useful already functions that enable you to perform reconnaissance, to obtain information about the, the target computer, to try to do pivoting, to obtain information about other computers, and that way you will be able to perform a lateral movement and attack other, other equipments. And of course, it will give you more information even about what applications are installed, what services are running. So again, as you might know, during a a normal, you know, kill of chain, one of the first action items is to do a good reconnaissance that that way you will be able to discover vulnerabilities that could be exploited. So again, the idea is to um, perform this reconnaissance and then execute malicious commands using good tools. So PowerShell is a good tool. It's a very useful um, tool that enables us to perform, you know, a auto automate task, a configure automatically several several devices, for example, to interact with Active Directory, to interact with Exchange. You can uh, obtain information about all your computers easily using PowerShell. And there are many very useful uh, you know, common LEDs available on PowerShell to do good things. Just as an example down here, I'm using just PowerShell just to perform a very simple backup. You know, With the copy item command, you can do a very simple backup. So as you can see, PowerShell is good and it's already installed on most of the Windows computers and servers. Another very useful tool is known as Windows Management Instrumentation or WMI. WMI has something interesting. WMI is a client server you know, approach um, system where basically you can uh, request for information or you can send instructions using uh, WMI, uh, you know, the WMI query language. Now this WMI system, the way it works is similar when you program using a object-oriented programming. So for WMI, every single uh, thing on the, on the network and even on the devices and the components of the devices at the end are objects. So we're talking about objects that has attributes and objects that has methods or actions that you can execute. So for example, it will be, there will be a class for hard drive. So when you reference the class of hard drive, you will be able to obtain attributes such as, you know, the size of the hard drive, the type of hard drive, and then you will be able to perform actions or methods. So there will be multiple type of actions that you can perform against a, a hardware, a hard drive. And as I said, because this is a client server approach, you will be able to send commands or you will be able to request information and the system will, in a, receive the instruction, execute the instructions and reply with a response or with the result of the execution of the action. Now you can combine these good tools you know, for your, for your good. For example, you can execute WMI commands using PowerShell. As you can see down here, there are several, several of them already 
be available. It's a very common let. So if you execute get dash command, you know, dash noun WMI, you will be able to obtain information about the existing uh, common lets that enable you to run WMI with PowerShell. Now there's another system. In this case, we're talking about the common information model or CMI. You can, again, use CMI on PowerShell to obtain even more data about your device and perform some specific actions, as, as you can see down here on this um, screenshot. You can also perform different type of queries using different methods. So for example, look at here, I'm trying to obtain information about you know, logical disks that are on this computer just by running get WMI object, you know, the Win32 logical disk. So with this command, I was able to know, you know the, the ID of the hard drive, uh, I know the size, how many um, space is still free, and the name of the volume. You can also perform some advanced uh, queries you know, similar to a SQL command, you know, select whatever you need from the uh, element that you want to obtain information. And again, you will be able to obtain basically the same data with two different um, techniques. Now, PowerShell is good. Don't, don't, let, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not saying that PowerShell, PowerShell is, is something that is bad, you know, to use. However, because it's so powerful, attackers are using PowerShell to execute malicious actions directly on memory. So what type of malicious actions? They are trying to perform some uh, uh, reconnaissance, of course, as I mentioned, figure printing, it obtain as much information about the operating system, about the applications that are running, obtain information about the services that are running, uh, try to uh, gather information about the user, what type of privilege that, that user has, try to perform you know, escalation privilege. And, and, and many others. Uh, of course, they will like and uh, love to perform some, create some sort of backdoor so they can come back whenever they want. There are several techniques for persistence and I'll show you shortly a couple of them, such as adding some of those commands that you need, maybe on the Windows registry, maybe you can use the schedule, a task scheduler. So it will be executed you know, whenever you want. So as you can see down here, again, we are we can use a PowerShell for figure printing. In this case, I'm using a WMI with Windows 32 and I'm obtaining information about this computer, you know, the computer that I'm that I'm an analyzing. So again, this is for the fingerprinted perspective. You can use another command in PowerShell such as, such as system info to obtain even more details. You can know, you know what operating system it is, it is running, what type of uh, processor it is using. You can even know what hotfix are installed. So when if you know what hotfix are installed, you can also know which hotfix are not installed. So which vulnerabilities you could try to exploit uh, during this uh, process. With WMI, there's you don't have there are also other ways to execute WMI uh, commands such as you know WMIC or MIC. In this case, I'm typing WMIC OS get to obtain information about the operating system. Now I know that is running as an example Windows 10 Enterprise Evaluation 64-bit version. So again, this is for fingerprinting purposes before we start the actual attack. We can know what products are installed. So we obtain information about the operating system. So now we can obtain information about products that are running on this specific computer. So we know as an example that is running Microsoft Health in update health tools. We can obtain some path where some data is, is some applications are sell. We can obtain information about versions of products. So again, for fingerprinting purposes, it's extremely useful. And if you wanna know what process are running on that computer, you can easily do it, you know, by typing WMI process list brief and obtain information about the, the process ID. You can, of course, try maybe try to kill one of these process um, and, you know, play around with it. So now the attackers know that PowerShell is extremely useful, but PowerShell is not the only tool or WMI that, that can be used to make attacks. The other way to make attacks using legitimate tools is by following the approach of living off the land, you know, also known as LOL. So again, the idea here is a same as Aikido, you know, this martial art where you're trying to use the strengths of your enemy to cause damage. 
So now we're using the strength, you know, of existing tools, legitimate tools for maintenance, for monitoring, for automation, for network monitoring or network management to cause damage. What type of tools I'm talking about? So there are many, look at here. These are some, uh, a quick sample of executables that are, that are part of the operating system, like PSXec, like WMIC, um, CBC, MSPIL, you know, many others that are a part of the operating system. And of course, some DLLs, DLLs that are legitimate, like the Windows 32 DLL, that's a very useful um, a DLL that is part of the operating system. So down here, the idea is to try to use them against the victim without the need of downloading additional malware. Um, so that, that yeah. So that, that's the that's idea down here, you know, try to use legitimate tools to make damage. As you can see down here in this screenshot at, at, the, at the right, I'm using a good tool, in this case, CERT Util. This CERT Util is normally used for management of, of certificates. So I'm using CERT Utils to hide a, a source code that I want to steal inside a file named vpn.crt. So that's that's a way that you can use, you know, existing tools to, comes, to cause some damage. So now let's try to understand a little bit more how a fileless malware attack is performed. So it is, it is uh, performed in different phases. The first phase is using social engineering techniques to be able to have a, some sort of shell, you know, a web shell, a reverse shell, you know, from the target computer. So you can do it using a phishing as an example. You use you can use smishing, you know, by sending text messages. Um, you can use existing tools um, such as the browser exploitation framework as an example. So you can try to hook the browser of the victim, and that way, once the, the victim uh, access that website, you will be able to interact, use a uh, meta exploit or other tools to send malicious commands. But the idea again is just to have access to a shell. Once you have access to, the, to, the, to a shell, then let's try to use existing scripts, existing libraries, existing binaries to cause damage. So as I said, the first section is use social engineering techniques to take control of a shell or to have access to a shell on the target computer. You can create a copy of an existing website you can clone it, you can use a type of squatting and maybe send a SMS or send an email uh, with the hyperlink. You can attach a file that will execute a um, you know, malicious command and at the end will uh, create a reverse a shell that will make the, the computer, the victim to connect to the computer of the attacker. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the idea down here on the social engineering uh, section. Now you might think, okay, so I'm able to access this computer I'm able to have uh, shell access, but how I can uh, have persistence? There are many ways. One of the, of the most common way is to try to hide some of those malicious commands inside entries on your Windows registry. So that way uh, the information is gonna be there available. And of course you can use, you know, the, like task schedulers like cron in, in Linux or um, scheduler, you know, C, SCH task that exe to uh, schedule uh, recurrent uh, tasks. So now let's try to simulate an attack. So for example, let's say that I said that I was able to send an SMS or I send an email ad, uh, an email. Someone click on that email. That email uh, asks the person to access a website. On the website with browser expectation framework, I was able able to send them a payload, they execute the payload, and now, boom, I have access to a shell. So once I have access to the shell is where the party will start. So in this example, I'm going to simulate an attack where I'm gonna to try to steal information using fileless malware approach. So how I'm gonna steal information, I'm gonna to try to look for data that is relevant, you know, data that I could sell on the deep web, data that could cause damage to the company. Um, data that maybe the company will be willing to pay, you know, in order to try to recover. So I try to um, look for information that has PII, you know, personal and file information, maybe some Excel files that contain information about their customers, about new products, um, PDF, backups, you know, logs, whatever it is useful for the company that could be useful for the attacker to earn money. 
So just on this example, I maybe down here on the documents a folder, there are a couple of files. You know, in this case, a customer.txt file and a server.txt file. Imagine that this could contain maybe a list of existing customers with their email address, with their phone number, with their full name, with their position. Uh, on, on the servers, maybe down here, this file could contain data about, you know, IP address, the operating system of that server, maybe the name of that server, the function or service that that web server or server is offering. So you can, it could be useful for many purposes. So the first step would be, okay, let's try to steal the data. So the first step would be to have a copy of the data, zip the, create a zip file with the copy of those two files that I'm trying to steal. You know, remember the customer and the server TXT files inside that zip file, in this case, gold.zip. Okay, so that's it. I'm just creating a zip file with information that I want to steal. Again, as you can see down here, I'm using PowerShell commands and I'm using compress.archive. I'm not installing anything else to be able to perform this action item. Then eh, once I have a copy of the data, I want to delete the original files. How do I delete the original files using eh, legitimate tools? I'm using PowerShell, I'm using the remove item uh, command. This remove item is kind of, kind of interesting because when you execute this command, it will not only delete the file, it, but also will delete the file from the um, recycle bin. So there's, it will not be so easy to, to recover that file using this technique. Now, we were able to uh, save the file, delete the original files, and now we want to encrypt the file. How can we encrypt the file with without downloading a ransomware. So this is a, a very easy way to do it. We are gonna use an existing service that is designed to encrypt files. It's part of Windows. And in this case, I'm talking about the Crypt SVC service. So the first, the first thing that you have to do is to check if that service is running. How you can check it down here. You can make a WMI query, select everything from these Windows 32 service uh, list. And you wanna know if it is running and if this specific service is running. I execute this command and you can see it's running and it's active. Perfect, so let's use it. So how can we use it? We are gonna use another existing command that is part of Windows. You can even test it if you want. It's already uh, installed on most of the Windows versions. If you type Cypher, in this case, the goals, that zip file that I just created is not encrypted. So that's why it has a U. So in order to make it even a little bit more complex, I could even create my own keys and my own certificate if I want, as you can see, by using the same command cipher and then create my own keys. It will create a cert file and it will create a PFX file that will contain, as I said, the key and the certificate. Now, once the file has been encrypted, the goal, I'm sorry, once the, once the keys has been encrypted, the goal will be to encrypt the file. Using the same command cipher, we can encrypt the file. How we can encrypt it? By using cipher slash E, stands for encrypt, and the name of the file that we want to encrypt. So I type cipher slash E, gold.zip, and now I, if I run again the cipher command, I'll be able to see that now it says E, gold.zip, because that, that now it confirms that the file, with the zip file has been encrypted. Now with these ciphers, sometimes there are some portions of the file that could be easily recovered that are in plain text. In order to make the recovery process a lot harder if you don't have a backup, then there's another command that you can run to remove any remaining sections of the file that is still in plain text. In this case, you're gonna execute this, this command. Okay, it takes a little bit, it takes a couple of minutes, but at the end, it will uh, delete all those remaining of the original file that are still in plain text. Now, I was able to encrypt the file. I was able to zip the file, delete the original files, and now what? I, I need to find a way to have a copy of that zip file, right? So uh, in order to uh, try to hide the zip file, I'm going to use a steganography. How can I use a steganography? I'm gonna use, I'm gonna create a, a picture because I don't want to download anything. If I start downloading files, most likely some, a, a, you know, alerts could get triggered. So in order to avoid alerts to get triggered, I could use an existing tool, in this case, fsutil file create new. I'm gonna specify the name of the file. In this case, it's gonna be um, a BMP file. I specify the size that I want 
of the cover file. Why this is important? Because the cover file needs to be big enough in order to be able, to, so we can include and we can hide inside of it whatever we want. So it has to be bigger than what we want to hide. So that's why in this case, I'm selecting 58, um, in this case, you know, 58 kilobytes. The original file is just 1K, but I want to make it big enough to not trigger too many alerts. Okay, so this is just a picture that has been created automatically. And now I'm gonna use a steganography to hide that the zip file inside the picture. So I'm using the copy command that is already a part of Windows. I'm gonna use copy slash P because I want to modify the uh, cover file in binary mode um, and hide the gold that zip inside this picture. And it's gonna create an, a, a second picture that will contain the zip file that is hidden using some sort of a, a steganography algorithm. It could be most likely a LSP, you know, the least, in, least significant bit. But at the end on this picture is where the zip file is gonna be um, um, hide. And of course, I'm gonna use the same command that I used a few minutes ago. I'm gonna use the remove item to remove or to delete a, in a permanent way, the zip file that I create and also remove in a permanent way, the, cover, the temporal cover file that I create. Now, this is, this is where it gets really interesting. You know, again, I, I was able to encrypt the file. Now, how can I obtain a copy of the file using existing tools? So I'm, I could use Windows Defender for that. It, it looks kind of similar or kind of, kind of interesting, right? That the tool that is, that is designed to defend could be used also to attack, but in, this is not something like a failure from Windows Defender. It could, it could be done by a, using other type of tools and even other so, a security solutions. So this is just an example. I'm not saying that Windows Defender is not a good tool. I'm just saying that this is something that could be exploited. So I'm using a legitimate tool from Windows Defender, Conflict Security Policy.exe. I'm specifying which file I want to uh, receive and where I want to send it. So that way the attacker was able to obtain the information. Then after this, the data has been obtained, now the attacker needs to delete his tracks. A way to delete uh, tracks would be by maybe going to the event viewer and deleting a specific tracks or if a specific records from the event viewer. But if you don't have time and you need to delete it all in one shot, you can easily do it using PowerShell by running this command, you know, get event lock, lock name, delete everything. You see it's our recursive, um, action. So in just less than one minute, yeah, less than one, just a couple of seconds, the, the event viewer will be um, deleted every single record. So as you can see, before I run this command, it had like seven, almost 8,000 events. And after I run this command, there was only one that, that, that is left, and uh, which is the, the one that reflects that the audit logs has been clear. And then, well, this is just I am uh, uh, just the beginning. You know, you can continue playing around. You can leave a ransom message like this one. You know, you can ask for money or what, whatever is the objective of this fileless malware attack. Now, how can you protect against this type of attack vector? So it is really interesting and it's not, not that easy. It's a multi-layer solution that you have to implement in order to detect, in order to mitigate, um, in order to be able to recover also from those type of attack vectors. So the first one will be a, making sure that everybody knows um, and has a good cybersecurity awareness training, you know, continually, that is continually evaluated. Why? Because you, as you just saw, one of the first stages is to use social engineering techniques to ask someone to click on a, on a hyperlink to download something. So we need to make sure that our, our, our employees knows how to detect those type of attack vectors. They, they need to know what is phishing, what is vishing, what is a SMS phishing, and many other type of attack vectors. We need to also evaluate to make sure that the people are aware of that and that our, our system are secure. Uh, and of course, evaluate continually by coordinating penetration testing, vulnerability scanning continually to detect those type of vulnerabilities. And if possible, when you request a penetration testing, also try to um, suggest or to request that part of the technique used on this, the penetration testing includes social engineering um, 
uh, testing to make sure that people are aware and verify if people fail on those type of uh, you know lies. Another recommendation, definitely make sure that you have a good antivirus, that you have an EDR, you know, a, 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 a solution that would enable us to detect, for example, not only patterns, but also behavior, behavioral analytics to detect if, if, as an example, that there are some commands that are being executed after hours, the commands that are normally not executed on those computers, and suddenly they are being executed, you know, those behavior analytics it should be implemented. So you, you get notified in a tiny manner and perform specific actions. Make sure that you monitor all your different communication systems, including your email, your um, chat uh, systems, and keep an eye on your social media uh, tools so that you allow your coworkers to access, you know, because uh, social engineering could also be performed, you know, through Facebook or through any sort of social, uh, social media tool. When I'm talking about EDR, there are many EDRs that are very useful and they are now designed to detect uh, load bins, usage of load bins. Here we can see an example. Uh, on this uh, EDR, you know, the PowerShell execution is being monitored and it, it is triggering alerts based on some possible malicious uh, activity that is being triggered. Make sure that you only allow what is the what is really, really required, you know, minimalism, you know, like the least privilege. So make sure that you apply good separation of duties, that you have a only allowed a, a specific a ports to be open, a specific commands to be executed. Um, and as I said, I'm not saying don't this go down there, don't go down there and disable PowerShell everywhere. If you need PowerShell, use it, but just keep an eye on the usage of tools such as PowerShell. If possible, try to also monitor those accounts that has a lot of privilege, like using a privilege account management system to keep an eye on the usage of those type of tools uh, that could, for example, uh, create a, a new service or to disable a service or man, many other type of uh, malicious attacks. If you want to use PowerShell, it's good, but make sure that you lock, that you monitor. So how you can do it? There are many ways. One of the ways is to enable the PowerShell command execution uh, on the uh, group policy editor. And that way, uh, if you uh, integrate those logs with a sim, for example, if there are many uh, open source sims and also commercial sims, then you will be able to create your own use cases and keep an eye on this on the usage of um, uh, load bins and existing you know, uh, automation tools. Also, as you saw, one of the uh, actions that are performed during this process is not only using social engineering, but also trying to analyze possible vulnerabilities and exploit them. So make sure that your devices, all your devices, computers, network devices, mobile devices, IOTs, video cameras, whatever you have, has the latest patch implemented, you know, the hot fixes apply in a tiny manner, uh, that you make sure that you're using the latest version of the application and that you have also a good software inventory, that you have control on what applications are installed, who is using them, and why it, they, are, they are still using it. If, those, if any of those softwares are no longer required, make sure to delete those uh, applications from your uh, computers. And finally, of course, there's no one single tool that will solve, that will protect you 100% against this type of attack vectors. So make sure to implement a security in depth approach. As many layers as you can, it, it will make the life um, more miserable to the attackers and it will be for them a lot harder to recover their investment because at the end they, they have to invest time, they have to invest money to try to perform an attack, right? So if we add many layers for them, they're gonna see, okay, this company has too many layers, they, are, they, they have different type of security products, they know what they do, so let's try to attack someone else. So let's try to use another attack vector, you know what? Let's just stop the attack. This is, I'm I'm losing money because attackers at the end, they, they, you know, it's a, a cyber criminal organization. They need also to recover their investment. So make sure that you have a good network security, endpoint security, application security, that you develop applications thinking of security from day one, uh, operating operating system security, that you have data leakage preparation system to keep an eye on outgoing traffic or outgoing uh, information. And again, 
make sure that the that humans are not the weakest link on your chain. You know, make sure that they have the proper training, the proper uh, knowledge, and that you evaluate that knowledge continually. All right, that's it. I don't know if you have any questions so far. Hi, Juan. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, for anybody watching the talk, you can use the live discussion tab on the bottom right of your screen to ask any questions. Uh, while we're waiting for any questions to come through, we have a few minutes. So um, you actually touched on everything, I suppose, start to finish from you know education and training to um, implement the security controls to detection, all of that. So it was actually a very interesting talk. So thanks for that. Um, sure. Uh, the things I suppose that that captured my my uh, attention was again the putting the attention and the focus on social engineering and training the human. Uh, it's, it has been mentioned in a few talks today and actually in our keynote speech this morning. Um, unfortunately, companies that just don't want to spend the money it's it's so difficult to get out of this idea of you know, just read the policy and say I've read it and, you know, we're fine because this is what an auditor might ask. And um, I'm sure you see it all the time as a, as a pen tester. It's often the cause of just doing the bare minimum. What can we do that's going to, you know, make us kind of fly through the audit and forget about everything else? Totally okay. agree with you. Totally, totally agree with you. Unfortunately, people think, you know, many companies think, you know, I, 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 I have a small and medium company you know, SMB, you know, so who's going to attack me? You know, they normally attackers will try to find, try to attack big banks or they will try to attack big companies. That's not true. They are attacking those that has the, the, the worst type of security, you know, that the, the word, those that doesn't have the proper detection system, those that doesn't have the proper awareness. So they don't care. You know, they do that. They send it to, a, you know, in, in, in batch. And sooner or later, someone is going to be the victim. At the end, there are only three types of companies, you know, those that has been hacked, those that are being attacked right now, and those that are going to be attacked very soon. Yeah, so. you're, dead, you're dead right. Um, you also touched on um, just, I suppose, the, the basic hygiene, so do your monitoring, list privilege, and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, now you, you are heavily involved in cloud, so I bet... You see it a lot of the time where maybe engineering teams haven't really, I suppose, updated their skills with regards to cloud native environments, like of Azure AWS. So mm -hmm. is, it, is it common that you see companies maybe that um, say like a hybrid company, so they have some on-prem infrastructure and they have say uh, infrastructure on the cloud, say AWS, Mm -hmm. where everything appears to be fine on the hybrid on the on the on-prem side of hybrid but then the security controls aren't implemented correctly for the likes of say lambda because the developers haven't updated their skills so you know execution role potentially makes everything blow up and everybody can do anything on any resource is that something that you see i see a lot of a lot of a lot of things so i, I do agree that there are many um, companies that they start using new technologies because it's the boom, is is what are, what what's everybody's doing. But maybe they're not ready for that. They need to make sure that they have the proper training, that they update their knowledge. Um, remember at the end, what is in the cloud? The cloud is someone else's data center. So you are offloading some security things to the provider, but most of the security uh, responsibility is still on the customer. Remember the shared responsibility matrix. So companies that want to take advantage of the cloud because cloud has many advantages, believe me, many advantages and cloud technology is the future for sure. Uh, at least in the next five years, remember the technology changed so fast, but at least uh, right now I can say that cloud is the future. So a company needs to make sure that they uh, take advantage of that technology in a wise manner, you know, in a, in a, proper manner, not just doing it because everybody's doing it. Make sure that you do it because you're ready. Make sure that you do it because you have the proper training, you have the proper certifications and that you understand the technology, um, that you know what should be on a public cloud, what should be in a private cloud, how you're going to be monitoring. At the end, uh, the fact that it's on the cloud, again, it means that it's in someone else's data center. So you have to keep an eye on your assets, digital assets. Absolutely. 
Um, there's good feedback here on, on the chat. People are really enjoying your talk. Um, <laughs> there's no questions that are coming through. So I'll just mention um, one of the attendees was just trying to make a note and just to say to everybody if this, um, you know, if, if you're happy to share the slides and we'll share them with the uh, attendees. So the of people course. watch this talk. Um, but there's somebody just taking notes, obviously, as you were talking, and they're saying, um, just to make sure they covered everything from the tools, they got CrowdStrike, Exabeam, and Splunk. Did they miss anything, any other tools that you had on your slide? Uh, well, from the tools perspective, uh, well, th there are many. You know, to be honest, uh, I should, uh, there are so many options available that it's not fair just to mention, you know, brands. It's more like technologies, you know, no matter if you're using a commercial SIM or, or a open source SIM, because both can be very powerful. The important thing is that you use the proper tools and they are properly configured, that you know how to use them, that you know how to take advantage of them. So it, it just make sure that you that, that you get familiar with this type of technologies. As I said, CrowdStrike is, is great, you know, but there are other, also other type of EDRs available at the market. So it's a, it's a, there, there are so many options that it will not be fair just to mention just a few products. Yeah, what, whatever works for everybody. Every, exactly. every organization is different. Um, the, we still have a few minutes and actually a question came through. Um, yeah. Is there much difference in capabilities between LOL bins on Linux machines compared to Windows? The, the risk is exactly the same. The risk is exactly the same because at the end, those are operating systems that are that has many tools for maintenance, for scheduling automatic tasks. You know, as I mentioned, you can do a cron on Linux and you can schedule tasks using the task scheduler on Windows. So the attack surface is basically very similar. Of course, the command will be different. But at the end, if you think a little bit about it, there are so many servers or in so many services, especially servers running Linux around the world. So many desktops and laptops and why not servers, of course, running Windows. So both are very good um, examples. But remember that this could be performed in, in other type of operating systems, you know, like mobile devices. They have their own operating system, operating system that are also able to process requests. So this, this is just the... the Pick of the iceberg of so many things that you can do uh, using a uh, lolbins. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, there's no other questions coming through. There is a comment um, from somebody, just feedback on your talk. Mm -hmm. um, somebody here says that the importance of having tech specs and hardened, spe hardened specs has come true in your talk as well. And that's another area companies don't really pay enough attention and it's something that leads to, to these compromises that you were showing. Totally true. Totally agree with you. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that comment. Definitely. Um, okay. So uh, we have two minutes left. But there is no other questions coming through. So um, I guess uh, we can give people two minutes back. Uh, Juan, thank you so much for joining us. That was a very interesting talk. Con mucho gusto. You're very welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. And for the people watching, uh, oh, actually, there's a last minute question. Juan, don't go. All right. <laughs> okay. So the question is, to be in a position to run these tools, the attacker needs some level of privileges on the box. What is the most common method you see of getting this? Well, so, so first, first thing, uh, and this is a, a very common question that people ask me like, when I share, when I talk about this, this specific topic, you don't need administrative rights on the victim computer. As you saw, all those attacks that I, that I simulate were performed on a computer uh, when, where the user is just a normal uh, a standard user. It, it, you know, a user that doesn't have a admin rights as an example. So that, that is the first, the first thing that you don't need like to perform a escalation privilege to be able to, per, to uh, execute fileless malware. The second one, how normally you will be able to obtain shell access? Well, uh, social engineering is the best option. You know, you can use Beef, the browser exploitation framework, you can send payloads, you can use Metaxploit to design your own payloads. Of course, most if you, you, you create your payload to create your reverse engineer, reverse shell, 
uh, many of the current antivirals are able to detect, you know, those type of payloads. So the best uh, and more effective way is to create your own payloads, you know, because there is no signature available at that moment. So most likely they will not be detected if you create your own advanced payloads to uh, you know, obtain the reverse, uh, reverse shell. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And that actually brings us to the uh, end of this talk. Uh, thank you again, Juan. It was very interesting and uh, lots of nice discussion going on here in the chats.